I think it hasn't been the priority of, you know, the county in terms of youth employment. For far too long, we relied on the District of Columbia. It's funny, I was in a meeting this morning, or not funny, it's interesting. I was in a meeting this morning, and we were talking about the mayor. So when I say the mayor, they always think of Marion Barry, because he's the mayor. He gave everybody their first job. I know I got my first job. Out of college, I got one of his youth jobs. I cut right in under the age limit. But for far too long, us in the county, we haven't approached summer work and summer jobs the same way with the same intensity and focus that the district has. We're starting to do that now, about two and a half years into this administration. Clearly, it's something we should have started at the very beginning of the administration. Because one, the infrastructure we have right now is not set up so that we can actually attract those business jobs. When I worked for the D.C. government, when, they, when I got my first job, it wasn't with the D.C. government. It was with the law firm. It was how I knew I wanted to go to law school. And the reason I was able to do that was because their approach to the private sector was, you've got to come and be our partner. You know, it was an aggressive way of doing it. So what we're going to do from now on is we're going to have an aggressive approach to providing our children with jobs. Um, I, and I'll, I'll end with this, you know, LaVon and, and her staff are doing a good job. The council is taking this very seriously. Um, I'm going to have Barry Stanton talk in, in a minute, not just from public safety, but what we're doing in terms of youth strategy, because it all circles around to the same thing. But the reason it hit the intensity level this year was because we had six young people of school age killed in this county. Six before the year was out, lost their lives who were school age. And the state's attorney was really upset about these killings and, under, and wanted to know why we couldn't provide job opportunities for all of our kids who wanted to work in the county. And we couldn't answer that question, quite honestly. And so what we said to ourselves, clearly we've got to do more. We've got to make sure that our strategy for Public safety is not just around arresting and locking up people, not just around the police, um, but it also means how do we provide opportunities. The last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Mel is LaVon talked about you know, a number of our children who businesses don't want to hire because they don't have experience. You know, and they don't know how to you know, go to a job and, and get their own time, dress appropriately. Well. We've got to get our kids experience. And the only way you get experience is to have a job. I mean, that's it. That's what experience means. You've actually worked. So that means for us, we've got to provide opportunities for internships with our children that actually pay so that we get them in meaningful opportunities. So we're going to do an aggressive job of pressuring not just the government, because this year we said to each one of our departments, go out and find two or three jobs in there. Go find a, a real job. Give them some experience. If it's nothing more than shattering uh, someone like uh, Barry Stanton on how he does and how public safety works so that that child has the experience of working in these areas so that when they put it down on their job application, it's not simply, you know, I, um, as, as my daughter would tell me when I told her she was coming to work for me, she said, Daddy, I want a real job because I want to be able to get a job after, the, after this uh, made-up job you just gave me. I said, well, honey, I'm going to give you real work. But that's what we need for our, for our kids, and I know uh, the council member is committed to that. So I'm going to turn it over to Mel Franklin. Yeah, very, I, and I'm, I'm not going to take long on this one, but because uh, he said a lot uh, of what needs to be said. Um, we the budget we just came together on, uh, it almost doubles the size of the allocation for the summer jobs program. But in addition to that, we're going to be smarter about it. DC has a model that we need, to, we need to emulate. They partner with private sector businesses to help they'll subsidize all or part of the wages. The business says, okay, we'll manage the work and, and, and we'll, or we'll share some of the cost. And it makes it, it make economic sense for them to hire the young person. And then the other thing is absolutely true. We have to to, to associate it with some sort of orientation or training program. So our young people who are about to go into that workforce for that summer job have an understanding of what the expectations are and, and, and you know, how they need to dress, uh, you know, the, the, you know, how they need to talk and behave and things of that nature. So I think what you're going to see for next summer is a larger program but also a smarter program.
And I think that's the key, and I think that's what the county executive is talking about. And it's something DC, DC's done for a long time. And DC's had some pitfalls with it, but we've seen some, some of their mistakes and the benefits of their program, the things we should do in terms of direction going forward. Yes, ma'am. Right. Right. And that's a good point. It's one of the things that we haven't done in the past that we're going to do in the future. Not just with, if you think about it, over the next four years, Prince George's County is going to have about $4 billion worth of construction going on in this county at the same time. If you think about the resort casino that's going to take place, you think about the hospital, you think about what's going to happen in New Carrollton, uh, what's going to happen on Branch Avenue, all of the development around here, if we get the FBI coming to Prince George's County, so we could potentially have $4 billion worth of development. So what that means for us is now we have to take uh, the page that you're talking about, those companies who are coming in here, not just in the construction phase, but also in the ongoing phase, and that is after the hospital is constructed, there's, there are jobs that are going to be created and opportunities there. There are landscaping jobs and how you manage that. There are accounting jobs. So what we're going to do and when we say we're going to be aggressive is not just with the current businesses, but those who are coming in in uh, the building up phase and saying that we need you to be part of this. Part of your community commitment uh, for us, you know, doing infrastructure repair and paying taxpayer dollars for you to be able to bring the outlet mall here is that we need to have jobs um, in every phase of that and throughout the life of it. Uh, for the county and for our young people. And so we're going to look at throughout the county how do we do that, and we're going to be smart about it, as, as uh, Councilmember Franklin said, and that is where we're putting our dollars or where we're, where we're helping businesses come in here, either through our new Department of uh, uh, Permits, Inspection, and Enforcement. Did I get that right? Yes, DPI. Thank you. Um, so where we're helping them that we say we need you to step up to the plate and, and help us on that. Um, with that, we've got some more job, job questions. Marcita, you got any extra jobs over there? <laughs> we got some people with me. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't speak up about the fact that um, in Prince George's County, we do have the expertise and we actually have the track record of running wonderful summer programs. It's just that it's been in a silo in a sense that it's been for uh, youth who are economically disadvantaged. Um, with the WEAR program, which started in 2000, prior to that it was JTPA. I personally worked in a county over 21 years in youth services, and we run an excellent uh, summer program. You don't see us in a paper because we don't warehouse kids. We actually teach them work readiness skills. We have job coaches who are um, county uh, teachers and administrators, and we actually run a very good program. And so I know that working with County Executive Baker and the rest of the team, that we'll be able to collaborate and ensure for next year that we not only use the money in a smart way, but that we actually build a pipeline, because it's just not about summer programs. This is about their careers and moving forward. So I just want you to know that we do have that in the county. You do, and you do a great job. Let's give Marcy a round of applause. She does. They do a wonderful job. We need to deal with our youth. And it was a shame that we lost six youth, uh, probably, probably about six months ago, give or take, uh, in homicides. And with that, it brought to light some of the things we needed to deal with in county government. And one of the things the county executive heard and, and uh, public safety heard going out talking to communities is we have to find jobs. Find jobs for our youth. So right now, the county executive is taking the leadership role to do that. But the other thing is, the community says, we're tired of these youths running through our neighborhoods. We're tired of these youths breaking into our houses. Can you do something? The next step we took is we started putting our police officers out there for the summer months. Right now, we're looking at our crime initiative. We're going to start dealing with our youth. The other thing we heard in our schools is truancy. They're not going to school. What are we doing about it? We started talking to the state's attorney. And we started talking to uh, the principals, and we said, we want to find a way to deal with the truancy. So the state's attorney, along with the police department, says, look, we're going to start locking up parents. And everybody says, you know, are you serious? And we're serious. We're going to start locking up parents. 
because it starts with the parents. And nobody wants to say that, but you know, I, I grew up in the projects. But I knew when my mother said come in at, at 7 o'clock, I better be in at 7 o'clock. So we got to take some responsibility. So part of that is we're going to start dealing with that. And the other thing is under our youth strategies division, we're going to be starting looking at with Mr. Uh, Seaman, he's the CAO, with the homicides we had with the youth, we start putting together a team to start looking at all the issues that our youth are dealing with in our community. And you're talking about parenting, you're talking about mental health, you're talking about uh, making sure they get the right education, and you talk about jobs. So with that, with the council support, you're beginning to see uh, the fruits of our labor. And the one thing, as we all said, give our kids a job. And I don't really care what, what type of job, but if they work for me, they're going to be busy. You know, because we're going to keep them busy, but we don't really care as uh, long as they have a job. So at the end of the day, with the county executive support, the CAO support, we're looking at how we're going to deal with our youth in this community. Uh, I've got to commend the county executive. I work for him, but he's working us. He's working. <laughs> Let me just tell you, in public safety and across this government, we're working. We're trying to make this community safe. We have the lowest crime rate we've ever had in the history of Prince George's County. And, and you know, it's, it's partly because of people in this room, because you're not afraid anymore to say, I'm tired of these people breaking in my house. I know who that kid is down the street. And you can do this without giving us your name. You've got County Click. You've got 311, you've got 911, you've got non-emergency numbers. So at the end of the day, we're only as good as the community. And I think because the community is coming forward, you're beginning to see the reduction in homicides, the reduction in crime, and working hard in this community for you. So again, I'm going to stop talking because I could talk about this all day. I get excited about this. But because of people like all of you in this room and the police force we have, and the backing of the county executive that, and the council that have put their money, guess where? In public safety and education. And that's where it should be. So at the end of the day, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one reason I would like mm -hmm. that you're invited here <laughs> is because we're different. Mm -hmm. We're the southern end. Right. We don't have a lot of transportation. We don't have a lot of buses. Right. Our that's children right. are stuck. Right. I, you know, I don't have a teenager, so I want you to think that I'm talking on a personal note of me. I'm talking as a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, if you look at your record, our crime rate goes up in the summer. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because our children are walking around, and did your grandmother and mother tell you, I don't mind if the devil's work job? That's what happens here. They walk around, they don't have anything to do, so they get busy, and they get bad. And, and so and they go into these foreclosed homes. Right. They go, and, and crime happens mm. to me that shouldn't happen. Right. And I know a lot of this is certainly their parents' responsibility. But, but. I always believe it takes a village right. to raise right. a child. And, and somehow we as neighbors have to wrap our arms right. around these children and find out what we can do to help them. Not in 14. We need to find out what are we doing now. Right. Right. No, I mean, it's actually the approach that we're in. And thank you, Ms. O'Neill. I wanted you, I wanted Barry to come up and everybody else from the government to see that we all came down here um, because, isn't it good? We're here. And Mel, you know, was beating me up and said, you never go south. I said, yes, I do. I love the southern part of the county. It reminds me of home. <laughs> but no, on, on a, on a uh, very serious Serious note, um, we wanted the entire government to come here to show you that, um, one, is your government. And we want to be able to answer the questions that you're raising and the issues on how we're spending your money. Uh, what Mel talked about us doing in terms of, um, you know, focusing our resources in terms of, uh, of youth employment, in terms of education, in terms of public safety, we're doing all that while we're dealing with 152 million dollar budget deficit. Um, there are many things, this is for the third year in a row our county has gone uh, through a, a deficit. Uh, we had 77 million dollars when Mel and I first came into office. We had 132 million dollars last year and 152 million dollars this year. And what happens in Prince George's County is interesting enough is you would think it's because uh, the income in the county is going down. 
Not many think of you because of that. Income is down. The people are losing money. It isn't. It's not. It, I mean, a lot of people are like I thought. It was because we weren't uh, seeing an increase in our commercial tax base. How many people believe we've seen an increase in our commercial tax base? We are. You know what's keeping it our, our flat? It's property assessments and property taxes. Everywhere else in Prince George's County, just think about it. We have a AAA bond rating. We have income that's actually going up in the county. Commercial taxes are going up. We need to get more commercial tax businesses here. But it's our property assessment and taxes that are flat. So the revenues, which we pay for everything, all of our, most of our revenues come from property taxes. We don't have enough of that to keep up with, with the costs. And so we have to make very tough decisions. We have to do two things at once. Actually, we have to do three things at once. One is we've got to increase our commercial tax base at a faster rate, which is why the outlet malls, uh, the casino, resort casino coming in, the hospital, uh, New Carrollton, yeah. Branch Avenue, all of these development projects are for us to get more commercial tax base in this county. Because in Prince George's County, 70% of our money comes from residential property taxes and 30% from commercial. Everywhere else is the reverse. In Montgomery County, it's 60% from commercial property taxes and about 30% from, um, from residential property taxes. We're the only place that's out of balance. But it also means we have the greatest potential. So we've got to increase that. Public safety. People don't move here, stay here, and businesses don't come here if crime isn't going down, if the quality of life isn't perceived as being good. So we're doing, we're doing a good job in public safety. As Barry said, we're at an all-time low. But we've got to keep it that way. And the only way we can do that is not by the police, is by doing the things that you talked about today, and that is finding jobs for our young people, making sure parents have the type of wraparound services they need to, to be good parents, and to make sure that we provide these services for, uh, for, the, for the citizens as a whole. The other thing is education. People were, people were saying, why did I spend so much time in Annapolis fighting for better accountability, more accountability in our education system? Why did I want that? Because quite honestly, the council member and I have control over the education budget. We decide how much money they get. And once we do that, then really our hands are tied. Any complaints about education, we can freely say is their fault. But education is too important to the quality of life and to being able to attract people and retain them here and to make sure that it has an impact on public safety. That we've decided, I decided, and they came along, <laughs> that we should have greater accountability. That you should be able to ask us why isn't our education system improving? Why is our truancy rate the way it is? Why is uh, absentee in, in our schools the way they are? And why can't I just send my child to the neighborhood school? And when I send them there, why ain't there a sidewalk he can walk on or she can walk on? All of those things should come back the same way you ask about uh, public uh, transportation or public works or, um, or DER or any of those agencies. You come to the county executive in the legislature. You should come that way in education. For now on, that's the way it's going to be. Why? Because we have something no other jurisdiction in the state has. The executive branch has a full participation in the education system. I get to pick the superintendent, which means if I pick wrong, y'all know exactly who to blame. <laughs> I get to pick the chair of the school board, which means if I pick wrong, I can't say the school board did X, Y, and Z. I picked the leadership. And so since I'm picking the leadership of the school board and the superintendent and the council, because I was lonely <laughs> with all that responsibility, just in case y'all don't like what we're doing, I said, you know, y'all should volunteer to come help me. So they get to pick a school board member so we both can be in trouble <laughs> if it gets wrong. And you know what? That is the way it should be. We're not going to change this county and the quality of life the way we want unless everybody is held accountable, and especially at the top. And so for the first time in the history of Prince George's County, the county executive and the legislative branch are responsible for every facet of your government. We can't duck it anymore. Whether it's health care, 
jobs for young people, education, it stops here. And so it means for us that we not only have to work together, but I've got to figure out how it, each one of these departments contributes to making the quality of life in the county better. And so we're going to begin to do that. And we're, we're happy with the progress we're making. Um, it's not happening fast enough for me. I want a sense of urgency as if, you know, my, my child, my children need jobs. My girls are at home right now eating and messing up my house. <laughs> I need them to work. And I'm not the only parent that needs that. And so I want our government to respond the same way um, as if it was your child, and that's what we're going to do. I see there are questions here, so we'll, Mel's going to stay here and help me answer questions. Isn't that great? Protected. Yes, sir. <laughs> Right. He, you know, I, I would say this, and that's a good question because I got asked that, and you know, I, for years I answered it this way. I said, you know, my my wife and I came from D.C. We were part of that migration. I don't know if we, I don't know if I, I know she benefited. You know, she she added to the county. I'm not sure I did. But here's where we were blindsided. At the same time, not so much the population shift in, from the district to Prince George's County, but if you look at the quality of development and quality of life in those areas where they left. Mm -hmm. Go back to H Street, mm -hmm. go back to U Street, mm -hmm. go to Pennsylvania Avenue. I was telling somebody today, if you go to Potomac Avenue Metro Station, when I was a student at Howard, I ran to my apartment. Because if you walked, you got robbed. There's a Harris Teeter there. That neighborhood's changed. So where we were unprepared is, if we knew that was happening, and it didn't happen in one year, two years, it was a 10-year progression of building up, building up. Why didn't we do the same thing on the lines here in Prince George's County? Why are we just now looking at our metro stations, which are transit-oriented development? Why didn't we look at how commercial real estate and commercial taxes were going up in the district and do the same thing? We didn't do that. You know, so they built up on this side, making it more expensive for people to live there, where on the same side, if you go across the street to Prince George's County, everything was concentrated. That's going to change. And the reason it's going to change under this administration is because our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. That means every place inside, six areas inside the Beltway in Prince George's County, which if you look at those six areas, the indicators all were going in the wrong direction. Not just public safety, but health disparity, education, lack of job opportunities, lack of employment. We're putting the resources into those areas until we see a turnaround. So we have to do that in those areas at the same time taking care of the areas that are down here. So we were caught off guard, but we were caught off guard not so much by people moving here, but our response to the changing uh, dynamics in this area and, and, and putting ourselves in a better position to attract and retain businesses. And just to piggyback, you know, one of the things that we all know uh, just by interacting with some of our neighbors in other jurisdictions is they don't differentiate between Clinton or Capitol Heights, Brandywine or District Heights. They just say, they say PG County, you know, kind of as a pejorative. Uh, and, and they lump us all together uh, and lump the whole... So if we don't transform those areas that are where our biggest problems are in the county, uh, schools, public safety, uh, unemployment, if we don't help those areas, we don't help ourselves either because we're all hurt, harmed by that. All that said, we are working and fighting for resources down here in the southern end, and we, and we got to thank the county executive for taking the lead on making sure the District 7 police station was put in the budget from day one, unlike last administration, uh, where you know it was promised and it didn't happen. Uh, the county executive made a promise and came through, and that station is getting built right now. We, uh, we, should, we should thank him for that and a round of applause for that. But, but that's an example, you know, we need the, that kind of infrastructure down here in South County. We don't have enough recreation opportunities for young right. people. We're now going to build a 60,000 square foot sports and aquatic center right near, right next to Gwen Park High School. Um, and that's going to be great. But I will say, and it's going to be an extraordinary facility, all right? 
but, and it's going to be built in 20, it's going to be done, finished in 2016. But here's the thing, it's not enough. Um, we, we need to turn, and, and this is the one thing I'm going to work uh, when we get the new superintendent in and, and we get the new school leadership in. We need to turn every single school into a recreation center after hours. We really need to. And one of the impediments to doing that in the past has been the school system has been really hesitant about, and really kind of territorial, uh, about the building, about what happens in the building after hours. They just, uh, it's, it's pulling teeth. Some, some schools are, are very open to it. Others aren't. And the Department of Parks and Recreation will tell you, yeah, some schools, we, get, we have a great opportunity to, to do that. Other schools, yeah, maybe this year, maybe not the next year, principal changes, completely a shift. Whereas, you know, go back a couple of decades, it wasn't that way. After hours, you know, you could go to school to play ball, you could go to school to do recreation. That changed. And our young people are walking around uh, getting in all kind of trouble. So every school in the county needs to become a recreation center after hours. We need to work to do that. That'll save us from having to just build necessarily new facilities and use what we already have to our advantage. So that's one thing we need to definitely keep our eye, eye on as, as, our, as this uh, school reform uh, goes forward. We'll be able, I mean, and Mel makes a good point. We'll be able to do that now because we have a collaborative relationship with the school system, just like we're able to make the reforms in, uh, in our other departments because it's all under one, uh, one government. Before, the school system had its own, you know, own separate government, which couldn't separate handle culture. the problem. That's right, separate culture. Now it's merged into one. Um, I can take two more questions. Yes, ma'am. You know, and, and that's a good point. And it also goes into Mel's point about the school system. We actually proposed that to the school system. How could we pay for it? Or whether we could do it at a pilot. Because we had um, all day kindergarten at one point. That was one of the benefits when my wife and I moved out here. As soon as I found it was all day kindergarten, I was like, oh, bet. Um, yeah, yeah, still have all, it's all day. It's a pre K. It's pre K. All day pre K. It was all day pre K. But we went to the school system and we said, well, what do you think about doing this? And there were certain areas that didn't want it, and there were certain areas that want it. And so what they ended up saying was, we didn't even want to have an open discussion. So now, a long way of saying, now we have the ability to have that conversation, to figure out um, what it costs, and, and to see if we can do that throughout. So that is on the, um, is on the agenda item for, for us to discuss. Yes, ma'am. What are your children's ages? Uh, they range from 9 to 24. Oh, my God, you're a saint. <laughs> <laughs> I have three, and I have no hair, and it's all great. <laughs> and um, I also do volunteerism. And wow. one of my clients that I work with uh, has put in an application. They just got out of school. They put in an application for a job. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that they apply for all say that, you know, you've got the education, but you don't have any experience. So what I've Exactly. Exactly. And, and that, is, that is an excellent point. That's the experience part that, that we're talking about because a lot of our children, unfortunately, you know, those who are, just think about the kids you know who are in college. 
you know, but who need to work when they come home from school. Um, it would be great if those children, our children, could do the same thing that we see a number of kids who work on Capitol Hill. I know when my wife and I worked on Capitol Hill when we were in law school, um, a number of the kids would come down there and they'd, they'd work for, you know, these congressmen and all these committees. Intern, but they weren't getting paid. They were working nine to five or later. And we thought, oh my God, how do you do that? You're not getting paid for this work? Well, no, they were getting paid in the future because that experience they, they learned having there. When they got out of school, they were first in line to say, I worked three years for X, Y, and Z. So we have to figure out, and that's going to be our charge, figure out what type of incentive that we can give um, or ask the business to give to say, maybe do something like transportation, um, some type of, uh, you know, minimum stipend so our children start getting the type of experience. And also, our young people who are coming here um, from, uh, from school and our returning uh, citizens who, who were formerly incarcerated who need skill training. We've got to think outside the box and think about what are the various opportunities, but you're absolutely right. We've got to look at um, volunteerism. You'll, you'll find a lot of young people get great experience as interns, not unpaid interns, and then they transition to become paid because they, you know, they perform right. and they do a great job at it. So that, 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 that's definitely true. It's not a complete substitute for having that, that pay from day one, which you talk to a lot, a lot of our young people, they want to get paid. They want to get, right. I mean, that's just, that's the, the mindset nowadays isn't like it used to be, uh, where, you know, folks have more of a long-term view. Our young people are more than ever about instant gratification, immediate. Uh, but but that's, that's really, I think, our obligation to try to influence our young people to be willing to stick it out, uh, put in some time, put in work, uh, and, and then get the reward um, uh, later on. And, and actually have a, and that would be a great conversation to have with parents too. One of the things I tried to do, and I always use my kids as an example because they don't like it, um, but with our middle child is to not have her work a job job. But I said, you know what, sweetheart, you're going into your last year of college. Why don't you, you know, you know we're going to give you a little bit, and I mean a little bit for the summer because we ain't got much, but why don't you Go volunteer at a place where you think you might want to work when you get out of college. Just go to, but you know, you got to treat it like a real job. I'll give you gas money. But you got to go there and work every day, uh, just like, because it's a real job. But to give them the experience in those areas, because like you said, what will happen is if you went in there and said, I want a paid job at X firm, they might say, well, we don't have any paid jobs. But if you want to say, I want to learn this, so I'm willing to come in and volunteer, and you go in there, once you get out, that experience is. So we've got to talk to the children, but also to the parents, and just try and figure out how we can offer that, because I think that is vitally important. That's an area we're behind, and we need, we need to do it. There was a question back here, ma'am. I mean, we're, we're certainly, we're certainly, no, we're not giving up. We're certainly trying. We'll continue throughout, uh, throughout the summer. The, those where the budget, the county budget, the dollars we have to put into jobs, uh, that right there is gone. I mean, we've done it. We've, we've maxed out as much as we possibly can out of this budget. But where we haven't maxed out is actually turning to the private sector and to nonprofits and saying, here, let's think of some other things. Um, so that's the area we're going to continue to work on it and push. This has to be my last question. I, I just kind of want to make a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked in D.C. and for six months I'm a parole probation officer. And we did a special initiative for the youthful offenders, what we call them, between the ages of 18 and 25. And now you're working with a population that 
are entitled. You're working with um, young adults, young men and women, like you said, want the instant gratification, but most of our young black males, they need mentors. Mm -hmm. They need training because when I was growing up, as I'm going to college, I'm going to college, they're not going to school, they're not interested, they need somebody to get time. So even if the businesses aren't willing to hire them, then you guys possibly could, okay, let's get a group of us, and then if the schools decide to stay open from 6 to 9 or 6 to 8, All then right. we're going to come talk to you for an hour because you don't have a father. You haven't been raised by a male. You don't know how it is to treat a woman. You feel like it's disrespectful if somebody says young man to you. Mm -hmm. You're not dressing appropriately. Right. As also, you're going to have to kind of get creative, and you're going to have to get interested into what they're interested in. And these kids, young adults, they're into the social media. Right. They're into the Facebook. They're into the rapping. So those are the type of programs and initiatives that you're going to have to give. So if you can't pay them, then at least if they're involved in some type of activity that holds their interest, that will keep them off the street as well as reduce some of the crime when they have all this idle time. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right, and we certainly put that into our mix of as we approach young people, because you're, you're right. We're, and we're also looking at, um, we're looking at nonprofits that do a good job at the mentoring and, and reaching out to our young people. But all of those things are going to go into the long term. You know, we're lo not looking for a quick fix, but we're looking for long term structural changes in the county that will last throughout uh, this administration. With that, um, I'm going to, yes, ma'am. Oh, the, the brotherhood's come. Well, we already had the brotherhood's conference that we dealt with the issue of mentoring right. and working with their schools. And we had 500. Can everybody hear that? Women. The state's attorney um, had a, she did, last year she had a sisterhood, sisters, sisterhood conference. I know my girls went. Um, this year she had a brotherhood's conference where we talked about mentoring and a number of groups. It was really a phenomenal uh, conference at Bowie State, which really was the kickoff to some of the things that, that we've been talking about today, and that is how do we continuously put pressure on businesses to hire our folks, even if they don't get it during the summer. A number of our kids aren't going back to school in terms of they've graduated or they've gotten their GED. How do we make sure they get those jobs outside of just the summer so they get the experience to go on? And the other thing is how do we hook them up with really good mentoring programs and things that will keep their interest. So we're looking at all of those in terms of uh, our strategy. With that, I apologize. I'm going to turn it over to Mel Franklin, your council member. does a great job. <laughs> give him a short round of applause. That's right. That's right. They, twice a week, twice a week, they I just wanted to piggyback a little bit. District 9 is about to start a fatherhood initiative. Um, and we are partnering with the National, Father, the National Fatherhood Initiative, which is a national organization that focuses on how do we strengthen fatherhood, uh, reverse absent fatherhood in the community. Uh, and uh, it's going to, it's an effort that's just starting. If you're interested in it, being part of it right now, right now the, the way they build the effort is we start with a core kind of leadership group of residents and, and agencies, and then it expands to a leadership summit on fatherhood and then an ongoing fatherhood initiative, the implementation phase. And the focus is improving dads who are already here, dads who are not doing a great job, giving them ways to improve, uh, uh, mentoring from dads who are doing what they need to do, who can show those dads who you know, don't have experience uh, being fathers how to be better dads, but also to reach out to young people before they become parents, before they're ready. Which, which we're not doing uh, as, as, like we need to right now. Uh, and, and overall, it's all about how do we increase our, our male role models in, in the lives of our, of our young people. And so the National Fatherhood Initiative has statistics galore about the impact of having a father in the household. 
uh, and the impact of having our father active, even if he's not in the household, active in his, his, or his uh, child's life. Uh, and it's a big, it's a big issue. Uh, hopefully, when we do this effort in District 9, it'll be a model that's expanded countywide and then could even go statewide. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think what we have to focus on is, you know, the glass isn't necessarily half empty. The half full parts are we've got an opportunity as a county to move forward in ways we haven't in the past. I think you have a county leadership now that's all on one accord, and that didn't happen in the past. In the past, you had county council off doing their thing, the county executive was button heads with them on this end, and there wasn't really a coordinated strategy like you see today. Uh, the, bad, the downside is that was when the money was actually coming in. If you remember, during the last administration, the tax base went way up. Uh, you had property values skyrocket, and so did the, and the tax base went up as well. Well, that was the time, unfortunately, that we didn't have the right coordination of resources and leadership at the top uh, between the executive and the council. And so I think we squandered a lot of opportunity in the last administration, opportunity that we're not going to squander now. Unfortunately, we're dealing with now this housing crisis, which is still depressing home values and, and property tax values. That's why we can't provide the kind of summer jobs program we need. We know we need to hire 5,000 young people in this county. We know that. We absolutely know that. Um, doubling it for next summer is going to help, but we need to, we need to send that five times greater, uh, and, and we've got we to gotta grow our budget to be able to do that. Uh, but we do have to be smarter about it, and I think that's what you heard the county executive say, is to date we haven't done that partnership with the private sector that we have in the county. We, have, we do have a number of, of businesses in the county that we could be partnering with right now to provide uh, summer jobs. You know, reorienting the money we're spending now to fully fund it through a county agency and being smarter about partnering with the private sector so you can actually hire more young people uh, for less. And so that's, that's the direction we're going in. Um, but it's not, unfortunately, it's not an immediate impact, and that's what I think everybody wants. They want to see something now, and even though we've gotten some results, it's not nearly where we need to be. Is there any more? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to change the subject. Mm -hmm. You left. You just ran out of Sure. That's okay. No. You're here, so you can take it back to him. <laughs> School board. Yes. My daughter is a teacher, mm. kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. She has 31 children. Yep. This, as you know, the teachers are not for this. This, this, this union, they, right. right. The union, because right. They have not been talked to or they're concerned. My question is, are you going to talk to the te teachers? These are the people who deal with the children on a day-to-day -day basis. Where do they come into mm -hmm. this mix? Well, one thing, and, and Levon and can... The other thing, okay. and part of that is the Title I schools are the ones that are getting all the money. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the federal government is want everything to them. Mm -hmm. yeah? So they're getting all the benefits, all mm -hmm. the extra books, all right. the... My sister teaches in the Title I school. She mm -hmm. teaches 10 cards. She has 16 people in her classroom. In the, the county? Money, yes, yes. All the money's thrown to Title I school. It, wait, 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 let, me back, let me back up. In, in the county, it's, it's not a specialty program. It is right. a... Con yes. That's true. You're right. The federal government. But if you make the tax scores, that's right. And if that's you right. make them, if you do what you're supposed right. to do, right. you get nothing. You get the teachers, school. not only that, the Title I schools, schools teachers get bonuses. The Title I schools teachers. Yeah. Now, 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 now that's all Title true. One, but the, but I will say that's the federal policy. That doesn't. That, the county doesn't decide all that. But let, it's a philosophical. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting discussion because. You know, my son goes to kindergarten at Marlton Elementary uh, near, near, right, I walk him to school every morning, so it's, it's a great setup, but he's got 27, 28 kids in his kindergarten class and no assistant, all right, and, and, that, and that's ridiculous, but the, the issue you just, just raised, the federal government has decided, and this is not new, they've been doing, this is the way the, the Title I program has been, which is that the, kid, the, the schools that have the highest poverty population are going to get the lion's share of that Title I money. And, 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 you know, the argument goes, well, you know, those are the kids most in need. And so the federal government says that's where they channel their money. Now, folks down here in South Carolina say, well, wait, we pay taxes too. You know, and, that, and this is what I'm saying. Um, so we need to grow our tax base. That, that's, we spend 60, over 60% 60 of our budget 
on public education in the county, when you consider the state aid that comes through the county budget, see, over 60%. If Montgomery County has a school system budget that's twice the size of ours, but their school population is maybe a 20,000 kids large, it's not, not that much larger. So they're able to provide all of these additional resources that we're not, that we're not providing our kids. They can provide smaller class sizes uh, that we're not doing. So we as a county, and, and you know, you're going to hear me talk about this till I'm blue in the face. We had a business and community forum on Tuesday uh, talking about this very issue. If we don't grow our tax base, all of these conversations are academic. They're all pie in the sky. I mean, you, you, I mean I'm, just, I'm just being real with you. We, you, know, you. You heard us talking about all of the great things we want to do as a county. Uh, and, and we're definitely moving in that direction. But if we don't grow our tax base, the summer jobs program is never going to be the size we need it. If we don't grow our tax base, we're never going to have enough police officers to cover South County the way it needs to be covered, fire officers to cover South County the way it needs to be covered, recreation programs to cover South County the way it needs to be covered. We've got to grow our commercial tax base. We've got to turn our metro stations into thriving hubs. We've got to do targeted, uh, uh, positive, high-quality high, uh, economic development on that 5301 corridor. And we're seeing some of it in Brandywine, but we're not seeing the kind that we need on the whole corridor. And we got to have infrastructure. We need light rail going from Branch Avenue Metro Station all the way in that corridor down to, to Waldorf, and we need to expand Branch Avenue. But at the end of the day, that all is driven by what can we as a county afford in terms of our budget. We've got to grow our commercial tax base. The other stat that we, we hadn't mentioned tonight, but we, but we mentioned, that it's mentioned a lot, is over 60% of our workforce leaves the county every day. So you got at the same time our, our, our and these aren't unrelated, that's why I mentioned at the same time, our tax base is 30% commercial, 70% residential. In the meantime, the flip is going on in terms of the, the residents who are leaving the county to work. Mm -hmm. You know, 60 to 70% are leaving the county mm -hmm. and, spending and spending their money elsewhere because the jobs aren't here. I used to be, I, I worked at the Attorney General's office, I worked in DC, worked at law firm. I did the same thing because the jobs were there. So you went where the jobs are, but when you do that, you spend your money right where those jobs are. So that's why we've got to create jobs here in the county. It's not just about retail. It's about creating high quality jobs in the county, which will drive the other stuff, drive the amenities and things like that nature. But, but as, as people will tell you, as employers will tell you, they don't want to come because of the school system. They don't want to come because there are not enough amenities around. So some of it's chicken or egg. We've got to get all of it right at the same time. Uh, and that's the strategy we're, we're pursuing. Did you want to, did you want to add? Um, I just wanted to address the issue on the teachers. Um, Mr. Baker had meetings with all of the unions, um, teacher union, principal administrator union, cafeteria, drivers, everyone. And um, it was the responsibility of the leadership to carry that conversation back to their members. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I have not heard PGCEA formally say that they are against it. I could be wrong. Um, I know that there are some teachers who are for it. Um, Mr. Baker has had an open invitation to anyone who wanted to have a meeting. Um, he met with the principals. I guess the PGCEA didn't afford him that same opportunity. I don't know that, that they did not ask, so I'm not saying they did not ask, I just know that it has not happened. Um, the teachers are a different bunch. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to, I mean, you, the unions are, you just have to respect the relationship and the protocol with unions, and you just can't go in, people said, well, why can't he host a meeting with the teachers? He can't do that. Um, so he has to respect the protocol. But any, uh, we got um, hundreds of emails from people from various walks of life around the country, around the region, um, either for or against the school reform. And some were educators, and they gave us very specific comments about what they would like to see. Um, Mr. Baker is a strong advocate for teachers. He would never do anything that would be detrimental to teachers. He is a strong proponent on increasing the salaries because, he, as he says, we are training ground for everyone else. They stay five to seven years and they leave. Um, he's talked about the fact that, um, you know, the, the principal he said today, you have a principal at Suitland who has 2,000 kids the principal someplace else who has 400 students, maybe in an elementary school, he make the same money. 
And so there has to be a conversation about wage and um, opportunity for incentives and all of those things. And that's what we get with school reform. We get that opportunity to have that conversation. Um, someone mentioned about transportation. Um, with the gentleman here, you talked about the, the school, the junior high and the high schoolers riding on buses together. Well, we have a transportation unit in Prince George's County government. So they will be working with the school system on transportation issues. As Mr. Baker said, why would you have students walking on a road that has no sidewalks? Well, they say they didn't know when they made the bus schedules. So you don't, you don't, you won't have those, hopefully, you won't have those situations. I mean, it's true. My kids, I live on Willyard Road, and when we moved there, the bus driver said, Make sure your son does not cross Woodyard Road. I'm going to have the route changed, but until it's officially changed, just know that I'm going to U-turn and pick him up. And I said, okay. The bus drivers are the eyes and the ears, and so we rely on them. And so some of them just make changes because, but that's not always a good thing. So those lines of communication are now open. We, the, the government is now accessible to Prince George's County Public Schools. The wraparound services that will need, be needed through family and social services and the health department, they have a team. Um, Betty Francis is the um, DCAO, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Health and Human Services, and she's been working with the, the counterparts of Prince George's County Public Schools who deal with health and um, um, uh, behavioral health and all those kind of things, physical health, um, with her uh, leadership to talk about how they can supplement and support what's needed in the school. So it's a start. It's a start, and we just ask that you ask the questions, send your emails, stay engaged. Ms. Holt has a sign-in list in the back. I hope you've put your information. Snail mail, we're not going to be using. It costs too much. You got to get online. You got to get an email account. Um, everything's going electronic. Um, the seniors in the uh, State Department of Aging, they're asking all seniors to get an email address because everything's going to be emailed in the future. So if you get on our email list, we will make sure you know. Someone said, how do you know about the jobs? We'll email it out. Um, Mel Franklin's office has a wonderful email that he sends out. So we just ask that you engage us and we'll stay engaged with you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I want to say as a retired teacher, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was a teacher for over 40 years, and so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, she brought home work every day, but she had an environment that she liked. And, and, and most, I'll say most, a lot of our teachers can't say that in the county. Right. And probably most wouldn't, wouldn't say that the environment they're teaching in is a good environment. Uh, you know, and, and let's, let's face it, if we don't attract parents back to the school system, we're going to continue to struggle. Even if we get a little increase in budget, we're going to struggle um, because you're going to, you, right now you have two school systems. You have the specialty school system, the TAG, magnet programs, APIB, all of the, the, all of the specialty programs, uh, the academies at the high school level. Then you got everybody else, the, the comprehensive education as they call it. That's where most kids still are. Well, right now a lot of parents and parents in the room who made this decision, you, 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 you'll relate to this, have said, well, if I can't get my kid into one of these specialty programs, I'm going to opt to private school. That's exactly what's happening. So, or out of county. And what's happening is, at various stages, sometimes you'll stick it through elementary, but say, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to opt out before middle. Or you might stick with it through middle school, but say, no, I'm not going to send it to the high school. I'm going to go private now because I couldn't get into the right uh, program at the, at the high school level. So, we need to focus on how do we yet yeah, continue to strengthen our specialty programs so that more kids who want that opportunity can get in them. But we got to do something about everyday classes, the comprehensive classes, so that people don't feel like one that it's not a safe uh, environment, and two that it's not a dumbed-down curriculum. That it's not a dumb that, that it won't be a situation where your kid graduates, you think, wow, they're ready, then they go to college and they need remediation, which a lot of our kids do. I was, on the board, I was on the board of trustees of the community college for a few years. That's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, and these are graduates. These are not, I'm not talking about kids that have dropped out. I'm talking about graduates going, going to the community and, and, and needing remediate, not ready for college. So one of the reasons I think the county executive focused on the school reform is 
we got to take the bull by the horn and, and say, look, we, we're all accountable now. Uh, there are no excuses anymore. We're not going to we'll be able to point the finger and say, well, that's the school system, not us. The executive branch and the school system are going to be all integrated. And, and I think that's a good thing. You won't have duplication of a lot of things you have right now. You have communication like you, you've never had before between the school system and the county. I don't know if a number of you have called my office about school issues. Well, usually I can't do a whole lot. Usually I have to refer it to the Board of Education member or I can't, you know. And now that's all going to change. Now the county executive's office will be merged, essentially, and his agencies merged and integrated with the school system, which I think uh, is a positive.